My name is Ethan Anderson, and I'm a full-time urban explorer. I run a successful blog with my best friends, Noah, Moore, and Daniel Clark. Together, we've made a name for ourselves by exploring some of the most abandoned and forgotten places in the United States. We document our findings through stunning photography and engaging storytelling, sharing our unique perspective on the world with our ever-growing audience. We mostly made money with our coffee table books documenting the photographs, vibes, smells, and other descriptions the viewers can't experience just through the pictures. One day, while going through our usual routine of scoring the internet for new places to explore, we stumbled upon an anonymous comment on our blog about a hidden ghost town from the mid-1800s near Yuma, Arizona. They also mentioned that the town had been abandoned in the late 1800s due to its people mysteriously going missing. The town was supposedly untouched, as the author of the comment described the town as being remarkably well-preserved, with many of the original buildings still standing and the interiors intact. Intrigued, we decided to investigate further. We spent hours combing through the old newspapers and historical records to find any information about what may have happened to that town and its inhabitants. We discovered that there had been a series of unexplained disappearances in the surrounding area at around the same time, with some people simply vanishing seemingly into thin air without a trace. We decided to go on a road trip to Yuma, Arizona to see if we could uncover more clues about this ghost town and its mysterious past. It was a long drive from San Diego, but we were excited to embark on another adventure together. As we neared our destination, the landscape began to change, becoming more desolate and rugged. The air grew hotter and drier, and the cacti started to appear in great numbers along the side of the road. I fell asleep after my turn to drive, and we had made it to Yuma by the time I had woke up. We spent a few hours driving around and talking to people in town, but only a few could give us information. One guy claimed that his great-grandfather had once worked on a farm near the ghost town, but he knew nothing about the disappearances. Another woman mentioned that she had seen some kids playing around the abandoned town a few years ago, but she didn't think anything of it until she saw their disappearance posters around town. It seemed that this ghost town wouldn't be as great as the commenter suggested, but we had come this far and had to at least check it out. Strangely, the two people who knew it the ghost town didn't seem to remember exactly where it was. Just a direction down a road after an abandoned gas station south of Yuma. The only choice was decided was to find this road. We drove south for a while. We came across an old gas station with a sign that was so rusted and faded that I could barely make out the logo. It looked like it hadn't been open in decades. We parked my jeep at the rusty gas pump and got out for a stretch. This has to be the gas station, Daniel said as he shielded the blazing sun from his eyes. I follow his gaze to the rusted relic ahead of us. It could be. It's certainly old enough. I walked forward, the gravel crunching beneath my feet, and peered through the dusty windows of the station. Inside, I could make out the remains of a counter and a few rusted cash registers. The air smelled stale like it hadn't been moved in decades. Doors open, Noah announced before holding the door open for us. Jeez, oh, it smells like literal shit in here, Daniel says as he covers his nose with the top of his shirt. I stepped further into the station, my eyes adjusting to the dim light. The walls are covered in layers of dust and grime, and the floor is littered with ancient candy wrappers and rusty cans. I reach out to touch the old dusty register and brush off a layer of grime. It's solid, like it's been there since the beginning of time. 
so what do you think we go from here? Daniel asks, leaning against the counter beside me. The guy said if we turn right when we get here, it's about an hour and a half drive straight down the road. Noah explained. All right, I can't stand the smell. I'm leaving. Daniel announced as he leaves through the door we came in from. Noah looks at me and shrugs as he follows Daniel out the door. As I exited the building, I noticed a homeless looking man standing in front of our car, staring at its hood. Daniel and Noah are frozen right outside the door. Hey, can I help you? I say from behind him. The man seems to snap out of a trance-like state as he realizes we are standing there. Oh, hi, yes, sorry. No, I, uh, I... This is a fine-looking car here. So shiny. I could see my own reflection. He says as he lets out a creepy laugh that devolves into a coughing fit. After he calms his coughing, he continues. Name's Henry. This here is my house. Henry says as he gestures to the abandoned gas station. Hey, Henry. We're real sorry about going into your house and everything. We didn't know. Daniel desperately tries to convince the man. Henry looks at Daniel and then goes back between all three of us with a furrowed brow. Look... You, you gotta understand, there's no way for us to know that this was your house. Noah chimes in. Henry continues to look at us, and he eventually bursts out laughing again. This time, the cough fit brings him more to his knees as he holds on to the car's front bumper to brace his fall. I ran up to him, the other two men still frozen, and gave him a water bottle from my bag. I open the top and hand it to him and he coughs most of it up. Not wanting to be splashed with his diluted saliva, I got up and returned to where Daniel and Noah were standing. A few minutes later, Henry finishes the bottle and was back on his feet, trying to clear his throat, which sounded like it was a mucus factory. We all stood there waiting for him to say anything, unsure how to proceed. Thanks, fellas. Henry says as he starts walking into his house. Hey, wait. Noah stops him, but he keeps walking. Hey, do you know of the old ghost town that's kind of close to here? Henry stops and turns around to look at us, but now with a sense of intrigue. Holton? He asks. Noah looks at us as Daniel and I give him a look of confusion. Um, I'm not sure what it's called. But it's supposedly to be abandoned, but it's still in perfect shape. Holton, Henry confirms as he nods his head to himself. Stay away from Holton, boys. There's a reason no one ever discovered it after all these years. Henry turned around and walked into the gas station as the door slams closed behind him. All three of us look at each other, confused, before all laughing at the absurdity of the event that had just transpired. Well, you heard the man. Let's pack it up and drive back tonight. Daniel jokes as we all laugh together. We load the car back up and started down the road that was supposed to take us to this mysterious ghost town. The sun was beginning to set and the sky was lit in a beautiful orange and purple before disappearing behind the mountains. I started dozing off in the back seat before Daniel woke me up by shaking me. Dude, you slept like the whole trip down here. Noah slept half the trip, and I haven't even slept at all. So if I'm not sleeping, neither are the two of you. Nah, I don't think so. Noah proclaims as he protested the fall asleep behind the wheel. Just go to sleep now. Why do we have to suffer because you won't go to sleep? I ask. Because I'm too amped about this to go to sleep now. Plus, if we sleep, we'll be groggy and whatnot by the time we get there. Daniel says, knowing his request of me not sleeping is ridiculous. Ignoring him, I doze off again, but Daniel didn't shake me awake this time. We were about 10 minutes away from this ghost town when I woke up. The first time I noticed was the sound of Daniel snoring. Peeking into the front seat, I see Daniel passed out with his head against the window. 
I look at Noah, stifling a laugh, and ask him in a whisper, So much for all of us not going to sleep. How long has he been out? Probably 15 minutes, maybe. It was recent, Noah replied. I thought about shaking him awake as revenge, but I decided to let him rest for the remainder of the drive. When we got to the end of the road, it was a dead end, but it did have a small trail we could hike up to the rest of the way to the town. Noah puts it in park and Daniel jolts awake to the sound of the car changing gears. Ha ha ha, we all gotta stay awake, huh? I say as I laugh at Daniel. Daniel regains his composure. I could tell that he was exhausted, which did not surprise me. Daniel didn't like to sleep in cars, and the only time he did was when he was so exhausted his body made him sleep. He yawns and stretches his arms. Look, if anyone deserves the sleep, it's me, he said before trailing off back to sleep. Noah shook him awake this time as Daniel's body was practically tossed around in his seat. Noah was the biggest and strongest of the three of us, and he didn't use it often, but when he did, it meant business. All right, all right, freaking stop, a-hole, jeez-o, Daniel said annoyed. As we exited the car and got our gear in our backpacks, I felt like something was watching us. It was night now. I couldn't see anything past a few dozen yards in front of me, but I knew something was out there. We all took out our flashlights and began our hike. The man who gave us directions said the hike would take about an hour. I looked down at my watch, which read 8.17pm. It was getting late, but we had made it this far, and we had forgotten to book a place to stay for the night, so we all assumed we'd be camping. We'd been hiking for about five minutes when Daniel started slacking behind. At first it was fine as he was a grown man and he hadn't seemed to slack very far. Eventually after 20 minutes, Daniel had been slacking so much that we waited 10 minutes just for him to catch up with us. That's when we decided to set up a small fire and rest, hopefully giving Daniel enough time to recoup his energy. Noah started the fire as Daniel laid across a long rock near the fire. I gathered wood, mostly sticks, but we got a fire going, and Daniel was fast asleep, snoring louder than ever. After about 45 minutes, we woke Daniel up again, who was even crankier than before he went to sleep. Eventually, he proclaimed that he was going to hike back down and sleep in the car so he wouldn't slow us down any longer. We agreed, and he set off down the mountain and went back to the car. Noah and I decided to keep going. We didn't want to lose the trail in the dark and end up wandering the desert all night. The air was still hot and dry. The stars were out in full force, twinkling and shining bright above us. The moon was a crescent, casting an eerie glow over the landscape. Noah and I continued on our flashlights guiding the way as we hiked deeper into the mountain. The trail was rocky and uneven, forcing us to be careful not to trip or twist an ankle. As we hiked, I couldn't shake the feeling that we weren't alone. There was an unsettling sense of being watched again, but I tried not to dwell on it. Noah glanced over at me, his eyes narrowing in the moon's faint light. You okay, man? He asked, his voice low. You seem a bit on edge. I forced a smile, trying to convince him that I was okay. Yeah, I'm just thinking about Daniel, you know? I hope he made it back to the car okay. Noah nodded, his brow furrowed. Yeah, me too. Damn, that guy was moving like an old man back there. The air grew cooler as we gained elevation and the light breeze rustled through the branches of the scrub brush that dotted the landscape. We hiked silently for a few minutes, breathing in footsteps echoing through the canyon. Suddenly, a loud howl-like roar coming from what sounded like two wolves rang out in the air and echoed off the mountain's ridges. Only it didn't come from wolves. 
Not any wolves I had ever heard anyways. It was more like the roar of a bear or a lion, with a small howl trailing at the end. Noah and I stopped and froze, trying to locate the direction of the sounds. I would hear one coming from the mountain above to the right side, and one below us to the left. It was a pack of some kind of creatures, and they were stalking us. As Noah and I flailed our flashlights through the sky, trying to locate the sound, they suddenly stopped, and we hear them run away quicker than any animal I had ever encountered. Noah and I were still frozen, unsure of what to do or what this meant. Questions ran through my head. Would they be back? Should we turn back to the car? No. That's the direction that they were headed. So I looked at Noah. And without a word, we decided to continue further up the mountain to the town, away from the pack of whatever creature that was. As we continued to hike, we were both silently on edge, looking in any direction we heard noise. Do you think they'll come back? Noah whispers, his voice crackling slightly. I hope not, but now we have to keep moving to expand the distance between us and them, I said as I walked away and Noah follows. Suddenly, we hear another noise, but this time, it's a scream from a human. Holy shit, that's Daniel, Noah says. No freaking way, that doesn't even sound like him. Plus, he would have returned to the jeep way before we saw those things. It's probably a cougar or something. They kind of sound like a screaming person sometimes. I say with confidence that I'm trying to convince myself I have. Noah doesn't say anything as we kept moving, but I could see the fear in his eyes. It's mirroring my own thoughts exactly. I tried to reassure myself that it was probably just an animal, but that scream, it sounded so human. I can't shake the feeling that something is wrong. We continue hiking up the mountain, the air growing cooler and the silence pressing down on us like a heavy blanket. Every rustle in the bushes or snap of a twig sends us both jumping, hearts pounding on our chests. The sound of the creature that stalked us earlier seems to have disappeared, replaced by the rhythmic crunch of our footsteps and the labored breathing of our pursuit for safety. Just as we get to the peak of the mountain we are on, I began to see an old worn down water tower standing just outside of a small valley. The town had to be in that valley. As we got closer to the water tower, I could see that there was writing on it, but it was all too worn out to be deciphered. All I could make out was a first letter being an H. As we walk past the tower and into the valley, more of the town begins to come into view as I shine my flashlight around every corner. There was something weird about this place and not the weirdness I'm used to while investigating abandoned properties. I felt like we were being watched again as I tried to shine my light at the top of the cliffs to the sides of us. Once in a while, I could have sworn that I saw something scurry away as soon as I flashed it above us. Every time it happened, I looked over at Noah to see if he had noticed something quickly moving away from the light, and every time I did, he looked even more and more terrified. Hey, let's set up camp near the water tower. We could start exploring tomorrow morning when we have the light that we need, I suggested, and Noah nodded in agreement. I could tell that Noah was relieved that I was the one suggesting turning around since he was always trying to play the macho man. As we made our way back out of the valley, I occasionally flashed my light onto the cliff tops around us. This time, I didn't notice anything unusual. As we approached the water tower, I positioned my light so I could shuffle a clearing for us to set up camp. After doing so, Noah starts a fire and I collect enough sticks to last us until morning. It was still pretty warm but I wanted a fire mainly for light as I felt the darkness suffocate me. Noah and I set up our small tents and called it a night. I was awoken by Noah screaming from his tent in the middle of the night. I didn't know what time, but it was still dark. 
I rushed over to him, seeing him in the corner of his tent with his eyes wider than I had ever seen. What happened? What's going on? I frantically asked him as he seemed to snap out of a trance and finally notices me in front of his face. It's Daniel. I saw him. Those things attacked him. He said in a crackling voice, trying his best not to lose his cool. What do you mean? Daniel was here? I'm confused. I say frustrated. He paused and hesitated before responding. No, no, I saw him in my dream, but it was so freaking real, Ethan. It was like something was trying to show me what happened, he said. His voice got quieter and quieter the more he talked as he realized what he was saying sounded crazier and crazier the more he explained. Hey man, you're okay, Daniel is fine, trust me. You had a nightmare, that's it, I promise you. You weren't seeing a premonition of some past event you weren't even at. I explained to him as he seemed to start to calm down. He is quiet for a long time as he stares into space, contemplating just what had happened. Shit man, you're right, I'm sorry. Today has just been so freaking weird, you know? He tells me. Yeah, no, I agree. Today has felt a little off, right? Look, we just need some sleep, and I'm sure after Daniel sleeps, he will meet us up here before we even wake up. I reassure him. Okay, yeah. All right, thanks. Good night. He says, as I could tell, he is still a little shaken up. Yeah, good night. I respond as I return to my tent. Hey, Ethan. Noah says before I finish zipping my tent up. I stop and give him my attention. Could we, uh, leave our tents open tonight just to, like, you know, make sure each other is okay? He says sheepishly. I chuckled and agree, and I unzipped the entrance. Ethan fell asleep before me as I heard him snoring. I'm unsure how long I was up, but I was thinking about the day and possible explanations for the wild events. I had to admit, I was more excited than I was scared. This story would already be a great article if we decided to leave now, and when we explore the town tomorrow, we will have an even better story, even if the town is more run down than the commenter suggested. As I thought about this, I slowly drifted to sleep to the sound of Noah's snoring and the dying fires crackling. Oddly, I had a similar dream to what Noah suggested he had. It was as if I was one of those creatures that Noah and I encountered earlier. I had an insatiable thirst for blood and I noticed a man who had climbed into the driver's seat to my jeep. I knew it was Daniel, but something in my head didn't care. It was like there was a human version of me who tried to prevent myself from the thirst I was feeling, but the creature's cravings were far too intense for me. It was like I was no longer controlling myself, the beast was. Me and the other beast attacked the jeep's soft top cover, and shredded Daniel apart as we took turns eating his corpse. Suddenly, I'm brought back to reality and out of my dream as Noah shakes me awake violently. I open my eyes and after they adjust to the sun, I could see him frantic. Whoa, whoa, chill the F out, I said in tired frustration. Daniel didn't come back, he said, waiting for me to respond. I mean, he probably just slept in longer, dude, chill out. Let's pack up camp and we could wait for Daniel, I said slightly, raising my tired voice. Noah nods in agreement before going to his tent to pack up. It only took about 10 minutes to clean up camp and to ensure that the fire was totally out. It was 8.46 a.m. when I looked at my watch. By that time, we decided that Daniel probably wasn't going to catch up to us. It had been an hour and a half. This was the early 2000s, so it was rare for everyone in your friend group to have a cell phone. Of course, Daniel was the one to have one, so there was no way of reaching anyone. Dude, okay, now I'm worried. Where the F is Daniel? Noah asks in frustration. His frustration fueled mine as I lost my temper and said, I don't freaking know, Noah. If I knew where the hell he was, I'd tell you. 
You'd be the first one to hear. Hell, you'd be the only one I'd even be able to tell out here. Noah stared at me in shock, not expecting my reaction. To be honest, I didn't expect it either. I'd been as equally as scared as Noah, if not more scared, but I kept it to myself, thinking it made me stronger by not complaining. Look, let's just frickin' take some frickin' pictures of this stupid frickin' ghost town and get the hell out of this state. Noah responded, surprisingly calm. I nod and we continue down the small valley, able to see clearing around us and tops of the valley's cliffs. This time, we didn't encounter any unexplainable movements and noises like last night, but I still couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. It isn't long until we reached the old town. It was a stereotypical Wild West town to the point where it looked like an old abandoned section of an amusement park. Everything was faded, but I could tell what used to say things like general store and saloon, mainly by the layout of the insides of the buildings. Noah and I were in awe at the state of everything. Don't get me wrong, everything was faded and obviously worn out from the years of sitting, but it looked like people just up and left this place. While exploring the inn above the saloon, I discovered the old effects of the population there. I found jewelry, remnants of old US bills, and rotted clothes trunks that still had some ragged clothing left in them. It was as if everyone had to evacuate the town immediately in the middle of whatever the townspeople were doing. The general store was fully stocked with whatever hadn't rotted away by now. Hell, there was even some old antique guns found in all the buildings, some still in holsters attached to a belt that were still intertwined in a belt loop. Noah and I were so excited about this find that we had forgotten about the night prior and the eerie events. Noah was off taking pictures while I was taking everything in, mentally writing my article, occasionally writing down a note or two if I came up with something extra good and needed to ensure that I would remember it. The town was small with only a saloon inn, a general store, a barbershop doctor's office, and a welcome center. I headed to the barbershop next. Walking in was a little more difficult than any of the other rooms in the town as the door was jammed, making it hard to open. Eventually, after Noah hears me struggling, he comes to help me as we both slam our shoulders into the door. As it flies open, revealing a bookcase that had blocked the door. The building was what I expected all the other ones to look like, disheveled and ransacked. There was furniture upside down and everything bolted down had been ripped out and tossed across the room. Why would this be the only building to be ransacked, though? What the hell happened here? Noah asks hypothetically. Looks like some teenagers got here and caused havoc, although it's weird that this so far is the only building that looks like this, I respond. No way this was teenagers. Look at the table. He points across the room at the dense wooden table that was clearly thrown to the wall as the legs and supporters are shattered on the ground. No frickin' teenager could do that. I didn't respond, but I did take his words into account. He isn't wrong. There was a bookshelf that was too heavy for me to move alone, and that table, as I attempted to pick up on the top of it, was way too heavy for Noah and me together. I'm sure of it. As we continued to explore, I walked into the back room. In the back room, there were black spots that looked like someone had splattered it all over the walls and floor. As my gaze moved from the black splatters on the wall to the floor, I noticed a broken window to the left in the room. The window shattered, and parts of the wall around the window were torn through. I saw multiple partial skeletons scattered around the room, like something had torn them apart and eaten them. I backed away out of the room slowly as I'm shaking. I have never seen anything like this in my years of urban exploring. Sure, we had found a couple of dead bodies in the past, but those were usually homeless people who couldn't get help they needed. This was something else. Something had torn these people apart long ago. Noah? 
I say as I back out of the room, trying not to panic. Yeah? I hear from behind me, startling me and causing me to jump. Holy fudge! You scared the crap out of me! Look at this! I said, pointing into the room. Noah doesn't even walk into the room before he sees the skeletons scattered on the floor. He doesn't say anything as he slowly looks at me with wide eyes. Just then, we hear a noise that sounds like something big walking on the wooden porch outside the shop. Thinking quickly, I grab Noah by the arm and drag him behind a counter, hopefully hiding from whatever was out there. I placed my pointer finger against my lips, telling Noah to keep quiet. His eyes were still wide, blankly staring past me. I peeked out when the noise stopped, and I saw something terrible. In front of me, right outside the doorway, I saw two giant creatures, probably seven feet tall, as they started to enter the building. As they crawled through the door, they had to walk on all four legs to avoid hitting their heads on everything. The creature was like an amalgamation of humans and wolves, but not a classic werewolf, as it was more like a bad science experiment. They had jet black fur, but not everywhere, as it seemed to have patches of bare human flesh scattered around their bodies. Their faces were human-like, but it was like as if someone had taken a human and molded him into what looked like a wolf. Their faces were human, but their noses unnaturally stretched into a wolf's snout. They moved around like animals, but their eyes were so human, it was scary. As the two creatures crawled into the shop, I could hear them grunting and groaning with a deep guttural growl. As they got closer, I frantically tried to think of a plan to get us out of there as I tightly shut my eyes, hoping to concentrate better. Still, before I could, I heard Noah's scream fade out of the building as one of the creatures lunged atop the counter we were hiding behind and snatched him up. The other creature tried to grab Noah from its mouth, tearing him in half at the hips. He was still alive, so his screams were deafening until they faded. He finally felt the relief of death as I heard them chomping loudly on his body. I could hear what I assumed was them arguing as they growled at each other. After a few seconds, the one who had grabbed Noah initially ran away, and the other creature followed, likely trying to compete with Noah's lifeless body. I sat there frozen for a few seconds trying to process the events. I realized that now was my time to leave this ghostly town alive. Finally, after not hearing anything for a minute, I peeked back out and didn't hear or see them. I slowly got up and quietly as I could, cautiously looking outside the door but didn't see anything. Without thinking, I instinctively sprinted towards the trail that led back to the jeep and hopefully Daniel. Adrenaline was pumping through my veins as I returned to the jeep way quicker than I could have ever done. I made it back so fast I was even surprised to see the jeep that quick. As I spotted the car probably a good football field length away. I heard something big running towards me in the distance. I sprinted towards the jeep, hoping to make it before those creatures made it to me. As I got closer, I noticed that the jeep's soft cover had been ripped to shreds, and dried blood showed that Daniel was likely killed, as I saw in my dreams. Had these creatures gotten into our heads? I didn't have time to stop and assess the situation so I hopped into the jeep's driver's seat, mindlessly scooting pieces of human flesh out of the driver's seat. I turned the key, but it did not start right away. Stupid frickin' jeep had always been unreliable, and I had no idea the amount of damage that had been done by those creatures. I look into the rearview mirror and see one of the creatures sprinting on all fours towards me, moving faster than anything I had ever seen before. Luckily, the engine started, and I slam it into drive and took off, the dust behind me blinding me from the beast chasing me. After about an hour of driving and returning to the main paved road, 
I could see that the creature was no longer chasing me. I laughed hysterically, but it turned into a sob as I had the pullover. I looked around me and saw the blood and meat of one of my best friends. I was so happy to make it out that I had forgotten what had happened to my friends. When I returned to Yuma, I went to the police station to tell them what had happened. I didn't expect them to believe me entirely, but the looks on their faces when I mentioned the ghost town and the creatures told me that they already knew what was up there. They dismissed my claims even after showing them the jeep covered in blood. They kept me in jail, claiming that I had murdered someone viciously in the jeep and tried to tell the story to cover it up, but I was released after they couldn't provide enough evidence that I had committed the murder. I was treated like a criminal. I decided that I would never tell this story again, scared that I would be sent to the asylum or something like that. I decided to try to forget about what had happened, but as I got older and I am approaching old age, I have flashbacks and dreams about that place. It's not my memories though. I'm one of those creatures attacking some poor soul who had wandered into that town. I could see every future victim in my dreams, and I hope I could convince someone to believe me and take care of those beasts once and for all.